you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We need you. We need you, Holy Spirit. When others may be afraid to speak the truth to us in love, we are so thankful that you take the time, even in our service, to redirect the order of the service so that you can communicate to us through your servants. We thank you for the gifts that you have given to the church. It's clearly laid out in Scripture. God, we thank you that in your divine wisdom, you chose to empower us as believers to be able to communicate the message of God and to be the vehicle in which you work through in the church today. We thank you for that. Now, God, as Jesus, your son, often shared after he communicated even a a difficult lesson, he often followed it up with, let him who has an ear, let him hear what the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God would have to say. And so we give you that permission today. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Speak to us. Now as we get into your word, speak to us through the written word of God, the powerful and anointed word of God that is alive and active today. May it come alive in us. May the truth that is contained in your word come alive in us. Teach us today how to apply it to our situations, to our life when we are faced with difficult decisions that you would teach us how to apply God's word and to trust in it As we're going to learn today through Hezekiah that he trusted in you, Lord. He trusted in your word. Even in the most difficult circumstances, he believed your word and he trusted in it. Teach us to do that today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. It's at those moments that the sports enthusiast comes out in me when the Holy Spirit moves and communicates, and I, that's when I want to tell, tell you to just give somebody a high five or a fist bump because God is so good and so awesome, and that's the way he works. Amen. Thank you for that high five. makes me feel a little bit more spiritual. <laughs> Praise God. We serve an awesome God. And I, I know I said it earlier, um, but I'm going to say it again. He loves us so much. Some, somebody here today needs to know. I talked to two separate people, and I promise you, those two people, you're sitting there right now, you're a little skeptical because the, the message that, that Jennifer communicated through the Holy Spirit, I want you to know those two people, I didn't say anything to her about your situation, okay? You know, nobody needs to know the details. The Holy Spirit already knew. And he wants you to know, two, two individuals, you've been praying for a long time for something. And I guarantee you, as sure as I'm standing here, I didn't say anything. And the, the message of the Holy Spirit was that you need to hold on. You've been praying for a long time. You've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and you need to hold on a little bit longer. That's it. That's all I'm going to say about that. Praise God. We serve an awesome God. Loves you. Do me a favor and turn to the person next to you and tell them, it may seem cliche-ish, but God loves you. Go ahead, tell them. Turn to the other person too. God loves you. Now I want you, s- this is awkward. Even when I'm sitting in the audience, it's awkward sometimes, but it's fun. It helps us to interact a little bit. No, I really, this is why I want you to say, I really mean it. God loves you. Go ahead, tell them that. For those of you sitting by yourself, I really mean it. God loves you. He does. The wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit, some may refer to it as an interruption in the service. I don't think it's an interruption. It may be an interruption in our plans, but there are times, and for those of you who are new to Pentecost, we are a full gospel church. 
We don't just say that and put a label on us. We believe in all of the gospel. And we believe in all of the New Testament, including where Paul teaches us about the gifts of the Spirit because Jesus promised it to us when he went away. He said, I promise you the Holy Spirit. Some believe that it died out in the days of the apostles, that it was just a little kickstart for the church to get moving. But I am here to tell you that the Holy Spirit is alive and well. He's not on break right now waiting for Jesus Christ to return. He's alive and well, and he's active, and he's working in the church, and we still believe, we just went through our I Value series uh, just a few weeks ago, that God still desires to fill his servants with the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? You don't sound like you believe it. The power, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. Can we just give God a praise offering, not Pastor John? We believe that. The word dunamis means power in action, and that's exactly what happened. The Holy Spirit was in action this morning. You ever have those moments when you feel that turning in your, you, not your stomach, that's when you eat something bad, but in your, in your chest, in your spirit, you feel something turning there, urging you to do something. That's the Holy Spirit living and active in our lives. We need to thank God for that. Okay. Praise God, I have no idea where I am right now. So I know we're going to be turning in just a few moments in our Bibles, as I promised last week, to 2 Kings chapter 18. You can flip there, and uh, we're going to have our scripture text on the screen. I admitted last week purposely, it wasn't, didn't do it out of laziness, that I didn't put together a keynote because I wanted us to flip to our Bibles and, and really you know, visualize where it is, or your, uh, your tablet, your smartphone, your iPhone, um, whatever it might be, um, to be able to flip to it so that, so that you can see it. And, um, but this week, uh, it was pointed out to me, somebody said, and, and, I, and I felt the same way, that I, I like it on the screen sometimes, that way I can, I can take notes. So um, I appreciate a couple of individuals told me that, so that's why it's back on the screen. We are excited, and I want to reiterate again um, our revival services coming up. The Lord spoke to me a long time ago. Um, some of my neighboring churches in our last community that we pastored in, they would advertise the revival, and I had a good relationship with the pastors, and I said, I didn't know that revival was that easy. I didn't know that you put it on the church calendar and it just happened. I didn't know that. And they, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, revival is, is more than just an emotional charge in our spirits. It happens sometimes. Um, I think that uh, I, I wasn't going to say this, but I, I really feel um, that there's great apathy in the church today. And it's because, not because we are struggling with things and, and there's certainly sin prevalent in the world um, and we look at that and we think, you know, there's so many things going on in our lives and we have so many struggles and we're just, I mean, we're just really struggling. It's because we forget how good our God is. We forget what he can do in our lives and in, in, and in our church and in our nation. We forget that sometimes. There's great apathy and it, revival is more than just a stirring where we get excited and we're just, you know, we're shouting and we're praising God. There's nothing wrong with that. That, that I believe, is a reflection of a deep work that God does in our life. The word revival, a great working definition, I don't have this on the screen, forgive me, uh, a great working definition, a non-spiritual definition of the word revival is to bring something back to what it was originally intended to be used for. That's as simple as that. We were intended for so much more. God had so much more uh, and still does, has so much more planned for our lives. That's why I love Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. They're not plans to harm you or destroy you or, or, or make you sick, I'm adding to it, or uh, make you depressed or, or you know, just remind you how bad of a person you are. But my plans are to prosper you. My plans are to give you a hope and a future, something to look forward to, and God still wants to do that. So next week, I know we can't schedule it, but we can pray that God would send revival. And we have been praying. And so next week, I'm going to ask you as your pastor to do two things. We have purposely, as Pastor uh, Waters had announced, starting our services Monday through Wednesday at 6.30 for two reasons. One, so that we can give God adequate time because our uh, guest speaker coming in um, sometimes is known to be a little long-winded, 
And I, I can say that because I never am, right? <laughs> this is one of those long introductions. I got to move along here. But anyway, um, we're excited. We want to just give God adequate time. And I, Tim and I have been talking and, and praying leading up to this that, that we want to give God adequate time. So we're going to try to start our services earlier. But we are also uh, bringing in Zachary Adams, who is uh, Nina Adams' uh, grandson. And he is a, he's a powerful man of God. And we're excited to see what God's going to do. We're going to have children's services going on simultaneously across the hall in the fellowship hall. And we're excited. So we're trying to start earlier to encourage families to please be out. We are still working on nursery. If there's anybody who would like to volunteer one night, just one night, please let me know or let Pastor Kathy know. Um, and we need, we, need, we need three or four of those individuals and we'll have nursery. Um, and it's, it is hard, believe it or not, to get nursery volunteers. It really is. It reminds me of a story that I'll share another time because I'll go down another rabbit trail of how one pastor got volunteers. Um, so I'll leave you in suspense. But we just need some volunteers for each of those nights, and we're really desiring to see God move in our church, in our lives, and, and for it to stir something. But revival is not an emotional event. It is a deep work that God does in us, and we're going to look at that today. Last week, we looked at Joash, um, who uh, was a king a few hundred years prior to Hezekiah, and he was a king with great promise. Uh, my message last week was the almost but not quite revival. Uh, the, everything was set up for Joash. In fact, um, I shared with you there are times in our life where, we, where it seems like what God had promised to us, it's, it's not going to happen. Or, or it almost disappeared and we're about ready to give up on it. Uh, the story of Joash is that, uh, that his father is, is killed. Um, who was the king at the time, and his grandmother, Athalia, who was an evil woman, uh, she decided this was the opportune time for her to become queen over the nation of Judah. So she put herself in that place, and she killed all, uh, all her own children, uh, went after her grandchildren, all of the males in her family, so that she can become the queen. I mean, that is just hideous. And uh, at one, uh, Joash was, uh, was one year old when this happened, and Jehoiada, who was the high priest, uh, could, he, he couldn't stand it any longer. So about six years later, when, uh, when Joash was seven years old, he said, you know what, it is time for us to take back our nation. And so he plans this, this coup, and, uh, and he puts um, Joash as king, and then, um, of course, uh, Athalia found out about it, and it turns out that, that uh, she ends up uh, getting killed at the end of the story. And so the, the, this great picture is set up of, of potentially a great revival. The nation was in moral decline. God put a new leader in place, a leader with great hope. He began to make changes to bring the people of Judah back to where they were supposed to be, but... The almost revival never happened because, tells us in uh, the account in the book of 2 Kings, I believe it's chapter either 12 or chapter 14, it talks, tells us that basically Joash um, did not remove the high places. And that's what we're going to talk about today because Hezekiah took it one step further. I was fascinated when I was reading about the Great Awakenings, and I apologize if I spent too much time on that last week. I went home going, oh, I spent too much time here and not enough time there. But the Great Awakenings were powerful, and Tim and I um, were talking about it. Tim, uh, Tim Bennett, uh, the other night at the football game of all places, talking about it. And I said, that stuff just fascinates me to see how God moved in history, how, how his not only how science and the Bible go together, but, but how, uh, and God's Word really explains a lot of things that science just can't explain, but how history and, and God's word and mighty revivals go hand in hand. The first great awakening um, as a nation, we were still under the, the tyranny of Great Britain, and God began to stir his people, and uh, it was through that that many historians believe that that is what led to the American Revolution, how we became a nation. And then later on in our history, there was still a, a lot of uh, injustice going on, and the second great awakening is what many uh, believe stirred the embers for the civil war that the people in the north realized that that we are all equal it doesn't matter what what nationality we are it doesn't matter what skin color we are we are all equal in God's eyes and deserve to be treated as such and so it began to stir things and so we were talking about that and he made this comment and so I quote Tim Bennett this morning you can tweet it if you like 
Um, revival, some of you have no idea what that is, but those of you that do. Revival was birthed out of necessity. Really, the whole phrase was, the problem was, through all of those great awakenings, is that revival was birthed out of necessity. There was a need. There was a need. There was moral decline. There were problems. There were troubles. And so it began to stir people, and they said, you know what? We've got to do something about it. It is not until revival is birthed out of a genuine desire to experience God in a real way, to experience a deeper relationship with God, all that God has for us. I don't know about you, but I feel like in my life, God has more for me. God has more things that he wants to do through me, and I'm not content with where I am. I'm not content with, with uh, even with my own person spiritually. I want more. I want to go deeper with God. Is there anybody else in that boat? You're in the right position for God to, to send revival to your life, to your heart. My message this morning is revival begins at home. Revival begins at home. It's not an event that stirs, uh, stirs us and, and we, we wonder what's going on and, and, and we want it and, you know, that does happen. But where it's really birth, where it really begins is revival begins at home. What does that mean? Revival begins in us, first of all. It, it begins with every individual taking ownership of their own lives we need to stop blaming other people for our troubles. We need to stop blaming other people for our spiritual apathy and say, you know what, I don't care about anybody. No, I do care, but I don't care what anybody else does. I want more of God. I want a deeper relationship with God. I want to understand this book that I've been reading uh, for 30 years a little bit deeper. 33 years to be exact. I, I really want to know this more. I want, to, I want to understand what it means. I want a deeper relationship with the Lord. God wants to take us to that place. God wants to see something beautiful out of the situations going on, and, and, well, and we'll deal specifically with our nation today. Reminds me of a funny story that I heard. Um, God had looked at over the earth and he saw the moral decline of the earth and, and he decided, you know what, I, I really need to get, a, get my finger on the pulse as if God really needed to do that, but humor me with the story. So he decided he was going to send an angel down to earth and really take inventory and see how evil the earth really is. So he sent an angel down and the angel surveyed it and came back sometime later and reported back to God and said, God, uh, the earth is 95% corrupt, evil, and only 5% good well God didn't want to believe that he thought well you know what let me just send a second angel just to double check so he sent another angel down and she came back some time later and uh, reported back to God and said uh, said God um, the earth is 95 percent bad and, and only five percent good and God said well I already promised them that I wasn't going to destroy the whole earth with a flood again so uh, let me try to get let me try to reach out to those five percent and see if I could stir them a little bit so God in the modern day of technology decided to send an email out to that five percent and do you know what that email said you didn't get it either <laughs> did anybody get that email <laughs> sorry about that should I file that one in the archives <laughs> my wife had a bad day the other day and and uh, she felt like she failed as a parent and uh, and so the compassionate husband that I am before I left for work that morning she was at home working on some ministry stuff like working on Bible study or something and, and she said I'm just a terrible person I'm just a terrible mom I really failed and I thought oh, Lord give me wisdom I said you know what honey you're right <laughs> all the young husbands are looking at me like what <laughs> those of you I just recently counseled don't ever say that <laughs> I said, you know what, honey? Without the Lord, we're all ter terrible people. That's really the truth. We're all terrible. Sorry to, sorry to share that with you this morning. I said, but you know what? Because of what God has done in your life and Jesus shining through you, you are an incredible wife, an incredible mother, and um, children are very resilient. <laughs> now, she didn't beat her kids or anything like that. Just, you know, just getting a little... Uh, 
maybe worked up, and Chloe, little Chloe got a little worked up, and she was crying. I wanted to say, trust me, honey. All of the kids have been crying when I <laughs> dealt with them. I, I get them all worked up. I come in, especially, when, when, especially in the, when they mess with Mama Bear. I get in there, and I say, all right, guys. I start growling like a lion, so I do. I'm sorry. Our, our scripture text this morning, 2 Kings chapter 18 2 Kings chapter 18, Hezekiah, a couple of hundred years later, becomes the king over Judah. To give you just a quick, real quick back history, after the king of King Solomon, who was David's son, the history tells us that the nation of Israel split into two kingdoms. First, the northern kingdom of Israel, which was more heavily populated. Uh, Ten of the twelve tribes lived there. And then the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, the southern kingdom of Judah is where the capital city, Jerusalem, was found at, at this time. And out of the history of both of these nations, over several hundred years, the nation of Israel had 19 kings, and there was not one in the bunch that was good or godly. They all did evil in the eyes of the Lord. There were little times here and there where they tried to maybe make a change, but they were all evil. And when it comes to the southern kingdom of Judah, history tells us that there were eight kings out of their 20 kings that were somewhat godly. And there were five of them that are referred to by theologians as the five revival kings. We looked at Joash, and this morning we're going to look at Hezekiah, which many theologians believe was the greatest revival king in Judah's history. So let's look at it together. It tells us in verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 18, In the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he came, became the king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of of the Lord, just as his father David had done, or better translated, his forefather David. We already found out that he's not David's immediate son, but he is in the lineage of David, which is very important, um, dealing with the uh, prophecies concerning the Messiah. Verse 4, he removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah poles, he broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had begun burning incense to it. It was called the Nehushtan. In verse 5, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands of the, that the Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. From the watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. What a commentary on this king, King Hezekiah. How many of you have ever met somebody where, where it just seemed like everything that they did, they succeeded? They were like, back in high school days, they were great in everything they did. They were a 4.0 student, and uh, they were great athletes, and then you thought, well, you know, they're great athletes, so they can't do everything, and then they try out for the school play, and, and they get the lead role, I'm not bitter or anything, um, get the lead role, and, and they just succeed in, in everything that they do. I hated those people. <laughs> just kidding, I'm... The Bible tells us that Hezekiah succeeded in all that he did. It was not because he was talented. It's not because he graduated at the top of his, his class and becoming a king. It, it's not because of any of that. It's, it's because of some other things that we're going to look at this morning. And there, there are two specific things that I want to share with you. Yes, you just heard Pastor John say that I have a two-point sermon. Did you hear that clearly? <laughs> two points this morning that I want to share with you that really show us how Hezekiah made a difference, how, how not only did revival begin in, in his home and in his life, but he made a difference in a nation. If you think for a moment that, that our nation is, is, has gone to pot, that our nation is, is in such moral decline, take a look, read back at the history uh, of the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah, and, and even in, in our history as a country, 
at just the right moment when we thought it was all always lost, God stepped in and it always began with just either one or two or just a few individuals and God moved in a mighty, mighty way. Let me tell you, Hezekiah was not popular when he took leadership. When he began to make changes in the nation of Judah, when he began to stir the pot, if you would, he was not popular. There were many who were against him. Number one today, revival begins at home. And I've learned just a, I, several things out of this portion of Scripture, but two that I felt was so important. Number one, you can't go wrong by doing what's right. You can't go wrong by doing what's right. Let's say that together. Say it to somebody else on the count of three. All right, you got it? It's right there on the screen. All right, now one, two, three. You can't... Let that just sink into your spirit, okay? So where do we learn what's right? I found this very interesting in, in this story. Where do we learn what's right? Um, the Bible tells us in... Um, I, lost, I cut off my scripture text here, but I think it's in, um, in Proverbs 14, 12. In Proverbs, it's mentioned a couple times in Proverbs. But here, it, it, the commentary on Hezekiah says that he did what was right in the eyes of who? The Lord. I think that's very significant. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. In order for us to see revival begin at home, we must learn to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Not what's right in our own eyes, not, what, not, not the advice people are giving to us, but what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Not what's right, not, not what common culture tells us is right, the behaviors that are okay and acceptable, but what is right in the eyes of the Lord? What does he consider to be right and wrong? A lot of people today, uh, a, a lot of humanists say, that, you know, there's a lot of gray areas in the Bible. I, I, you know, I beg to differ. I think the Bible is very black and white on many issues, and we need to be very clear about that. What does the Bible say is right, and what does, does the Bible say is wrong, and how should we handle it? So where do we learn this right and wrong behavior? First of all, there's man's right. Man's right. Proverbs chapter 14 um, verse 12 is what I'm quoting this morning but it's also found in Proverbs 16 25 and I'm quoting this out of the ESV and I've just recently done a little bit of research on translations and you know, some of you may be happy uh, to hear the report that uh, among the ESV and the New King James that the King James is still uh, the most accurate as far as verse by verse word by word interpretation of the original Greek Hebrew and Aramaic and it, it, it goes word by word and it breaks it down. The ESV is probably a little bit, uh, the New King James, which came out in the uh, 1983, I think, was a little bit more understandable. Um, it took some of that King James isms out, which, by the way, there were, in the original text, there were no these and thous. Absolutely not a single one. But that was, the com that was common in 1611 for people to speak that way. So in 1983, the New King James Version came out, and it was still probably the most authentic verse by verse, and the ESV is, is a little bit more newer. And it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. There's a, a way that seems right to man, and whether we realize it or not, that way is very prevalent in the world today. And believe it or not, it has crept into the church more and more. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it's the way of death. It leads to death. There's man's way of doing the right thing. So let's look at Hezekiah, his family history. You know, we read about him, we think, wow, he must have, he must have had a fantastic upbringing, right? Right? I mean, he, he got in there, he got into office, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But you are totally wrong. If you look back a little bit and you read about his father, went down in history as one of the most evil kings in Judah's history. As evil as they come, allowed human sacrifices, allowed sexual behavior to go on, because that's what the Canaanites did that was inappropriate to God. He did not, in fact, have a very good upbringing. He didn't have a good example. So you might be sitting here today saying, you know what, I don't think I can really serve God um, the way that, you know, Pastor John is presenting this because, you know, after all, my family history. I mean, some of you may not know who my parents were, but I'm not talking about my parents. I good God. <laughs> but, you know, my upbringing is not what you think it was. 
But Hezekiah can prove that anyone can change. Anyone can serve God if they are determined to do so. This is what the Bible tells us about uh, Ahaz, 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 1. Um, he was about the same age, a little bit younger. It says Ahaz was uh, 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned in, in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike David, his father, or again, his forefather, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Let me give you a little tidbit. You do not want that written on your tombstone, okay, on your memorial stone. You do not want that. You want the other verse about Hezekiah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. It says very clearly here, uh, he reigned 16 years, and, be, and believe it or not, uh, people prospered, and, and people liked his leadership, but he prospered as well. But he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and we want to look at that in a, a little bit deeper. Um, we sometimes learn bad spiritual habits from our family. We sometimes learn, um, one would call it dogma, uh, where man kind of makes their own religion as they go along and they say this is right and this is wrong and this will happen if you do this and this will happen if you do that and we kind of make up our own rules as we go along. I think probably sometimes in, uh, with good intentions, I think sometimes out of frustration people didn't know what to say. So the best response was, well, you're going to hell. I mean, that was just the quickest, best response. But there's probably something a little bit deeper. That's a truth that, you know, that we know. That's what God's Word says. If we do not surrender our life to Jesus Christ and make Him the Lord of our life, God takes no pleasure in it, but that is, hell is reserved for those that choose to do that. Sometimes we learn, um, we learn from our family bad habits. I heard this story just, uh, just this week. I um, was listening to a, a, a message um, and uh, this illustration kind of came across, and I just thought it was so powerful. Um, There's a story about a police dog. It's a true story. I looked it up. Um, who was a, a chase dog? He would, basically they would try to. Uh, they would. Uh, he he was a part of the canine unit. They would chase him down the car when the offender got out of the car and took off running. This this police dog would chase them down and tackle the assailant and hold him at bay until the police officers came. So this chase dog was was the best around. And this dog took off one, at one time and and he ran across three lanes of traffic and he got hit by a car and a truck just demolished uh, his, his rear, uh, his, his hind legs, his hips, everything. And um, believe it or not, the dog survived. And it was some time later that they found out that this dog was pregnant as well. And so uh, the dog, as, as it learned to heal and, uh, the, and, and, his, and uh, her body naturally healed, uh, learned to walk a little differently. This dog would throw her paws out like this and then drag her rear legs behind and just do that and uh, certainly couldn't serve anymore chasing people down. But the strangest thing happened when this dog gave birth to her pups, that when those pups began to learn to walk, guess how they learned to walk? They began to throw their front legs out and drag their rear legs behind. Throw their front legs out and drag their rear legs behind. The veterinarians had a very difficult time, eventually did teach most of the pups how to walk properly, and even some of them became service dogs. But sometimes we learn bad habits from our family, and I mean no disrespect at all, and it's very difficult to overcome those things. We almost have to really learn how to walk again. Secondly, man's way that we learn, we learn from man is, is in culture. Now, it tells us in this scripture, it talks about the high places, it talks about the sacred zones, it talks about the Asherah poles, and it also talks about the pole, the staff that Moses had that had a snake um, uh, on it, um, an engraved stake on this pole. And I, I want to just break it down for just a few moments because it tells us that Joash, we, we don't read this in, uh, in the account in the book of Kings, but we do read it in Chronicles how Joash did not remove the high places. What the high places were um, is the Canaanite gods kind of infected, of course, Israel and Judah. And these were places of altar worship. But they weren't in the city. They weren't right there in the city uh, because, uh, of course... Um, according to Jewish law, they couldn't be anywhere near the temple. That was, that was a no-no. But as long as it was outside the city, nobody really said anything. They were outside the city. They were places of idol worship. There were 26 Canaanite gods, and 
and uh, there's probably about six or seven of them that are just horrific gods. One of them was Asheroth, um, which is where, uh, where we get this uh, reference to the Asherah poles. She was a, a sex goddess in, uh, in the Canaanite um, way of living. And uh, basically, it, it was uh, people would go there and have, have sex with prostitutes, believe it or not. And uh, they did that because they believed that the gods of the Canaanites would prosper them, prosper their, their animals would conceive more, that their, their crops would produce more. And they had many other practices that I'm not going to mention this morning, uh, many of them dealing with human sacrifice. And this stuff was going on. This stuff uh, came about basically um, after, really came uh, prevalent after Solomon's reign. We know Solomon's history is that he was influenced by these Canaanite wives and he allowed this stuff to go on. I believe today that there's a lot going on outside the city. There's a lot going on in the high places that we're not willing to deal with. We need to bring it home to ourselves There may be stuff going on in our life that nobody is aware of. It it looks good. It's not right there in the city, so it looks good. But it's going on. It's out there in the high places. And what God wants us to do is to deal with those things. It's uncomfortable to ask God to reveal those things to us. And it's very uncomfortable to have to deal with them ourselves. But God wants to do that. See, revival isn't just an emotional event. It's not just something that... You know, that, that, that's a surface thing. That stuff is, is a direct result of God doing a deep work in our life. When we let God to begin to deal with the high places in our life, then God will send revival. Um, the Bible tells us in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 23, early on in history, where these high places came from. It says they, they also set up for themselves high places, Uh, sacred stones these were stones that that were meant to mimic um, if you remember through uh, Israel's history that there were times like when they crossed uh, the Red Sea that that God uh, told them to set up an an, an altar and then also set up memorial stones to remember what God had done well they were kind of mimicking really the God of uh, Abraham Isaac and Jacob the Canaanite gods were like, you know what? Our gods are just as good. We can set up our own memorial stones and wait and see how many people worship those things. And so that's where these came from. And the Asherah poles, many believe, were possibly like a grove of trees that were carved um, into these images of Asherah, the, the sex goddess of the Canaanites, and some horrific things. She was referred to as the fertility goddess. These were the Canaanites and the Syrians who worshiped them. Um, so we learn, unfortunately, right ways that, that are really man's right ways, sometimes from our family, sometimes from culture, but then also sometimes from religion. Sometimes we develop bad behaviors. We, we develop um, what theologians refer to as dogma um, out of what was once a good practice. And this is where... Um, the pole with the bronze snake on it uh, came from. It tells us in Numbers chapter 21, uh, verses 8 and 9, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. And so Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. And when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. And so this was a reminder, again, from God that he is able, that there was divine healing back in the Old Testament, believe it or not, that he was able to do this. It was something very significant. But what ended up happening was that people began to worship, in a sense, religion. People began to worship, worship practices. And that's what was going on here. It tells us, and it's a very sad commentary, that they began to burn incense to this pole that was made by Moses. The, the very thing that God wanted uh, them to, to use to remind them of his goodness, they were distorting it and taking it out of context and worshiping, in a sense, their own religion. So there's man's right way, and let's look at God's right way of doing things. God's right way. It tells us in verse 4 that he removed the high places, he smashed the sacred stones, and he cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the sacred cow, the pole, the staff, 
He broke it into pieces because he knew that it was causing people to stumble. He broke into pieces the bronze snake that Moses had made again because up to this time the Israelites had been burning incense. Think, where did he get this from? Why didn't anybody else think about this? Let me tell you that God spoke to at least the eight godly kings in Judah's history to remove these things. But it goes back much further than that. Look with me in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Verses 1 through 3, and we're, we're, kinda, we're bringing this to a close here in just a few moments because I believe that God wants to deal with some of the high places in our own life, some of the things that we're holding on to. They may not be religious practices. They could be hurts. They could be offenses. It could be things that just, just simply are holding us back from victory in Jesus Christ. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. These are the decrees and laws you must be careful to follow in the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has given you to possess. As long as you live in this land, destroy completely all the places in the high mountains, on the hills, and under every spreading tree. This is where many believe the asteropoles uh, were found. Where the nations you are... Uh, um, you are controlling worship their gods. Uh, break down the altars, smash their sacred stones, burn the Asherah poles in the fire, cut down the idols of their gods, and wipe out their name from those places. This was a command that God had given to Moses long ago as they went in to possess the land of Canaan, but they simply could not do it. But let me tell you today, God can use anyone Anyone to stir the embers of revival, but it must begin at home. Believe it or not, 117 times in the Old Testament, the Jews were commanded to tear these things down. 117 times they were commanded to tear these things down. But what did it take? What did it take? After nearly 800 years of history, it took a 25-year-old king who came from an evil father to begin to tear down those places. Don't tell me for a second that you can't be different than your parents or your ancestors. Don't tell me for a second because the New Testament tells us otherwise that just because you are young students that you cannot begin to stir the embers of revival, that you cannot make a difference in this world and begin to change things in your life, in your family's history, and in the history of our great nation. Don't tell me for a second that God cannot use you because if he could use a 25-year-old king who, who came after 800 years of idol worship which was not popular in God's eyes to change everything and say we're going to get back to where God wants us to be if God can use him he can use us God wants to speak to us I thought about it including some of these right ways, some of these things maybe that God wants us to change. And I began to compile a list, and I had like three pages. So I said, that'll be a long message. So I'm just going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to speak to me, to reveal to us what some of those high places are, what some of those things that are holding us back from really experiencing God. And it doesn't matter how young or how old we are. I think to myself sometimes, God, I'm, I'm 45 years old. I'm halfway to 90. 90 in my eyes is the new 60, so <laughs> I still got a lot of years left, Lord willing. <laughs> 33 years I've been serving the Lord, and I still, there's still some things that rear their ugly heads, some, some old habits and, and some, some, just some old thoughts and just... You know, uh, last night, actually, after I finished my message, the enemy just kind of reared his ugly head, and I got so discouraged. I was like, oh, I don't know if this even makes sense. I'm like, you know, I, I don't know. And, and the enemy just was coming at me. But God definitely spoke to me, just encouraged me the way that he does. So let God speak to you. And here's what you have to do with it. We must respond to God. There's no other way. We must respond to God and let him deal with those things. For James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, but primarily verse 17 says, 
So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, this is very key. For him, it is a sin. Sometimes we blanket everything and, and, and God deals with us about our own personal convictions and we have this tendency to throw it on everybody. You know, that's, that's our personal conviction that God dealt with us about. Now, I'm not talking about the black and white areas of sin in Scripture. I'm talking about the things that God is dealing with us about. Sometimes we throw it on everybody. So if God speaks to you and you know the right things that you're supposed to do and you fail to do it, I'm very sorry to say this to you this morning. It's sin in God's eyes. And we must deal with it. Here's how we're going to kind of wrap this up. I'll invite the worship team to begin to come back. I wanted to try to end a little bit earlier to really focus on letting God do something in us. See, in Hezekiah's case here, and I purposely focus a little bit more on the beginning part of that rather than the end part of that verse, those few verses. In, in his case, trusting the Lord, and, and still in our cases, will cause us to stand out. Trusting in the Lord will cause us to stand out, but it's not only in the way that we want to stand out. I mean, come on, we all want to be popular. We all want to have recognition. We all want, you know, we appreciate the accolades and things like that. But in Hezekiah's case, because he trusted in the Lord, look at verse, verse 5, he trusted in the Lord. Scripture says there was no one like him. Really, the better rendering of, of that is not, not just that there was no one like him, like he was heads and tails above everybody else, but in the way that he trusted the Lord. In the way that he trusted the Lord, there was no one like him. Have you ever met somebody that, that God, you know, really, really just spoke really to them and, and they responded and God worked in there. They just had such faith. I mean, even when something was like really like put right in their face, you're like, how, how do you have such faith? That's what Hezekiah was like. He, tr he trusted in the Lord. He kept the commands of the Lord that, that God had given to Moses. But it goes on in verse seven to tell us not only that, but he took it one step Further, It says that he rebelled against the king of Assyria and he did not serve him. Not only that, but it says from watchtower to fortified city, so basically all over his kingdom, war broke out. He was like, no more of this. We are gonna, we're going to push you back and we are going to wipe you out. We are taking inventory and we are making sure that God is the God of this kingdom. And we all need to do that in our own lives. Devil, enough is enough. It's time to wage war. And guess what? We don't have to wage war by ourselves because the weapons of our warfare are not earthly weapons but spiritual weapons and they are mighty in God. You begin to pray and, and the angels are praying along with you. You begin to pray in the Holy Spirit and, and the Holy Spirit is working through your prayers and Jesus Christ, your advocate, is sitting at the right hand of the Father praying for you. You begin to wage war and I can guarantee you that God will bring victory in your life. God will begin to destroy those high places no matter how difficult they may be. So he rebelled against the king of Assyria. The rest of the story is that the king of Assyria, real quick, came down... And he conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. And he took over there. And for about 14 years, he was breathing down the neck of Hezekiah. Nothing else happened. And then all of a sudden, they began to move on the fortified cities. And if you look at in, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 18, if you read through the rest of that, he comes and he begins to threaten Jerusalem most powerful city in the, in the kingdom. And as he was breathing down his neck, Hezekiah did make one mistake. But we'll give this to him. He earned it honestly. He learned how to do it honestly. When we're pursuing God, remember this, that the enemy will rear his ugly head. Those old habits, those old ways, he'll throw back at you. And you may slip, you may begin to struggle with some of those old habits, but there's a way out. There's a way out. Scripture tells us that he learned this by example. His, his father, um, Ahaz, 
he responded in a, in a similar way. You don't have to turn there, but it tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, you can go ahead and join and begin to play something there as we wrap things up. When he was confronted by basically the same enemy that, that his son Hezekiah would be confronted with, this is the commentary on him in 2 Chronicles chapter 28. It says, Ahaz took some of the things from the temple of the Lord and the royal palace from the officials and presented them to the king of Assyria, But what did it say? That did not help him. See, when we surrender the sacred things of God, it it may seem like it's going to take off some, you know, a little bit of temporary relief, but it's not going to help us. When we surrender those sacred things of God, it will not help us. And this is the commentary on him then. In his time of trouble, King Ahaz became even more unfaithful to the Lord. You see, when we surrender the sacred things of God and it doesn't help us, it will cause us to go down a slippery slope and we will become more unfaithful to the Lord. We will begin to grumble and complain as the Israelites did when they went into the the land of Canaan against the Lord. But God wants to begin to deal deeply within our hearts. So Hezekiah, he learned it honestly. He certainly did. What happened was the king of Assyria came and he tried to do the very same thing that his father did and he he took some of the things from the temple and he tried to basically pay off the king of Assyria. But it didn't help him. But then God gave him an opportunity to repent and he did. The commentary on his life was that God gave him more years to live. Tells us that he was sick and he prayed and God gave him health and gave him many more years to serve God it was still a chance for him I close with this read a story about um, an evangelist who was preaching on revival and challenging the church to do some of the very same things to start revival and a man came up to him afterwards and he said he said sir can revival really happen in America again, can it really happen? And so the evangelist answered him and said, do you, do you have a place that you can pray privately? The man said, well, yeah. He said, well, I'll tell you what you do. You go there and you take a piece of chalk with you and you kneel down there and with the chalk, draw a complete circle around you and pray for God to send revival to everything inside of that circle and stay there until he answers and you will have your revival I'd like to pray for us the worship team's going to lead us in a song and I'm going to challenge all of us to do that whether you do it here or around these altars or you go home and you do it and you get in your own personal place with God and you draw a circle around that spot and you get on your knees and you say God I'm asking you to bring revival to everything in this circle. When God hears that prayer, he will answer. He'll begin to reveal things to us. Sometimes ugly things, sometimes old habits, sometimes uh, religious ways. Whatever it might be, we need to allow God to deal with those things or revival will never happen. At least not for us. But the Bible does promise that there will be a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these last days. So we know it's going to happen. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of it. I don't want to miss out on that. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. I know that it was a challenging word, and I know that Hezekiah was certainly challenged when he discovered that he had to do some hard things. He had to to tear apart those hidden places. He had to go to the high places. He had to to get rid of them. He had to tear down, smash those sacred stones and burn the Asherah poles. And he went out and he sent others to help him to, to go out into the mountains, into the regions outside the city and really deal with things. And I believe that, God, you desire to do the same in our life, in our church and in our nation once again. So, Lord, we make this our prayer. I pray that each and every one of us 
would find that secret place of prayer and we would draw that circle and we would say, God, send revival to everything in this circle. God, help us to stop being so worried about what other people are doing and getting involved in other people's business and let's concentrate on our own business and what you want to do in that circle in our lives, God. Lord, we ask you for revival to come home to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us as we close in this song? I'm gonna ask you to do this. If you need prayer for anything and you'd like for us to pray with you, healing, whatever it may be, I'm gonna ask you to come right here in the front by the pulpit. But if you wanna respond in your own personal way, you wanna start to make that circle now, get off to the sides over here and just get alone with God. Let's worship him as we close our time together. And let's respond to the Holy Spirit today. Amen.